on this edition of The Self-Publishing Show. You know, it used to be the book was the ultimate completion of what you were trying to do. Now the book is almost like a business card. It becomes a tool that opens doors for you to get speaking engagements, paid speaking engagements. It becomes a tool for you to attract clients and customers. Publishing is changing. No more gatekeepers, no more barriers, no one standing between you and your readers. Do you want to make a living from your writing? Join indie bestseller Mark Dawson and first-time author James Blatch as they shine a light on the secrets of self-publishing success. This is The Self-Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Hello and welcome to The Self-Publishing Show with James Blatch. And Mark Dawson. I feel very self-publishing show in my... Although this is the live version, I guess we should do, once the conference is finished, a just standard... Yes, so podcast listeners, James is wearing uh, branded merchandise again. It is, it's always, it's quite weird actually to see my, basically I've branded James. My name is on all James's clothes now. And it was also quite weird when um, I saw a photograph from the uh, live show walkthrough. James went down to the, um, the, the festival hall to have a look through, it, look around at the, uh, at the venue and had James and what can only very politely be described as Oompa Loompas. Um, yeah. <laughs> I've, been, I've been reading Charlie the Chocolate Factory. Now, our, our wonderful helpers um, uh, in their branded yellow T-shirts getting ready for what is surely going to be the publishing event of, of the year, it, possibly the millennium. I'm pretty certain Elaine and Sam won't be... No, they'll be very angry. ...over the moon at being uh, described as Oompa Loompas. <laughs> uh, I think you're referring to the fact that they were so oversized crew T-shirts. Indeed, I was. Thank you for rescuing yeah. me there, yes. Yes, uh, so we had a good walk through it. The, actually, the Queen Elizabeth Hall, I should say, not the yes, Festival Hall, which is yes. next door. Um, and it all looks good. Very excited about being there. We are going to have a full house, at least a, a ticket sold for every seat. Um, about uh, the time we're recording, we're about to release the last batch of tickets, but that will be well gone by the time this goes live. However, what will be live, we are investing, seriously investing, in a professional production company to turn around everything that takes place on the day into a very slick looking series of videos. Basically, it costs quite a lot of money to turn a, a sow's ear into a silk purse. So yeah, it's yes. going to be it's going to be pure gold. Um, and those for those of you who can't make it to the UK, uh, who still want to benefit from what's uh, taking place on the day, and it won't just be the sessions. We'll also include uh, some sort of fun behind the scenes videos in that as well. We are going to create a digital package. It will sit there as a course on Teachable. Uh, we're going to price it, I think, at twenty five pounds, which is. $32, something like that, um, which is about as low as we can to cover the production costs uh, and so on. And uh, you can grab your ticket for that uh, if you go to selfpublishingformula.com forward slash digital, forward slash digital, D-I-G-I-T-A-L. Uh, sounded like a song, didn't it? And uh, we are going to aim to turn it around within a fortnight of the conference. So hopefully sooner than that, but within that fortnight, the sessions will appear there and you can uh, relive them. So whether you go to the conference or not, or whether you're sat at home somewhere and you can't make it, uh, you can take part in it. So that is going to be live by the time this goes out, which is going to be a week on Friday from the time we're recording. It's, it's Super Bowl week. I watched the Super Bowl. Uh, I, it's the only football NFL game I watch every year. So I'm that I am that person who um, who has to sort of catch up on the rules. And there's always bits that intrigue me about it. But it was a great game. And it, it always reminds me, and I've made this point before, that one of the reasons that we watch sport, the reason sport works and it's so gripping is why? Because it's a story and we don't know how it's going to end. And that game with that young quarterback who looks like he was 12 years old out of primary school here uh, in the UK, who looked, looked mean, like his helmet was slightly too big for him. Do you him. mean the six foot four Patrick Mahomes? Yeah, yeah, but he, he looked, you know. He does that, look young. He is 24 years old. He's very young. And also in the context of some of those linebackers and so on, he looks small. Um, and yet he, he focused, didn't he? He just stood there. You could see him just, he didn't, didn't show a lot of emotion during the game. He just got on with business and gradually after a, a perhaps a slightly lackluster first half, suddenly it started happening and then you get drawn into it, don't you? And it doesn't matter whether you like NFL or anything else. It's a story unfolding. Mm. And by the end of it, you're, you know, you're part of the ticker tape celebrations in your front room at four o'clock in the morning. I didn't watch it live because um, number one, my kids don't respect um, 
me <laughs> basically they, they <laughs> certainly, um, no they don't respect me and they certainly wouldn't respect the fact that i've just stayed up till four and they've got to get to school at you know so i'm up at quarter by six every morning so i didn't do that but i did watch it on I, in the on monday morning and it is increasingly difficult to be remain spoiler free now you basically have to not go online because yes. um i just about managed I, I kind of opened the guardian and i thought they were be reporting it prominently and it was like the third item so i saw chiefs I thought, yeah. ah, God, so I, I, I didn't, I didn't read any more. And then as the game progressed, it was like, well, the press they didn't win because it was, it was yeah. pretty, look, didn't look like it. But then even we've got um, uh, Echo shows around the house, two of them, and one in the kitchen. And I didn't see it on Monday morning, but yesterday I saw, pro, you know, prominently Chiefs win Super Bowl. Mm. So next year, I'm going to have to switch them off, I think, just so I avoid that. But um, when's yeah. the draft? When's the what? The draft. The draft is um, in about two months. So if, if Dolphins pick up this QB, is it a QB? I two don't know a, who it is. Two a tag of a lower, yes. And, and they get through to the Super Bowl, I guess we'll have to go. Well, I, I will. I, that's on my bucket list. Uh, someone actually said to me today, or the other day, a reader said, what is on your bucket list? And I said, oh, I'd love to go to the Super Bowl. I, I looked on, uh, actually on the broadcast, they said tickets started at $2,500 um, for Miami. And you could, obviously, you can pay... I think I saw somewhere people were paying like 50000 which yeah. is obviously just obscene. But they always publish those pit- – I've got friends who went to the Rugby World Cup in Japan, and for the semi-final that England were in, you see those figures going around at £800, £1,000 tickets. But I've got friends who were there and bought tickets for about 50, 60 quid because of people whose team didn't make it to the semi-final. Mm. So you always see those headlines. But actually, if you if you want to go, you'll probably find – I think the people. Super Bowl might be a little harder than that. Yeah, a bit more. Anyway, it's in Tampa next year. I've looked it up. In Tampa next year, that's weird. They Florida two it's, years in a row. Yeah, Florida two mm, years in a row, odd. and um, it's going to be on my birthday. Oh, well, there we go. So, well, I last year maybe. the uh, the 49ers went four and twelve last year. The year before this, uh, and obviously then turned that around and went like thirteen and three. I think this year to to make make the Super Bowl. So it's not impossible the Dolphins could be there. Very unlikely, but um, you never it's know. In their state. Yes. Anyway, enough uh, enough sports talk. Um, but I do enjoy a bit of a uh, bit of drama. That was what it was. Uh, so yeah, I thought I'd, I'd shoehorn that thing about narrative in there. Um, good. So we talked about that. Uh, selfpublishingformula.com forward slash digital. There's not a lot else to say at the moment because we're ten days out from this going out. I am at the moment heads down in in the granular detail of making sure that the day. Uh, works sufficiently well. There are lots of aspects of it, but um, I think we're getting there. Yeah, I've been um, in, I've been firming up the schedule today. So um, we've got um, Jasper Joffe, Michael Andalay, um, Ollie Rhodes from Bookature, um, Kashini Nadu from he used to be at Bookature now is at Hera Books. We've got uh, Louise Ross, Barry Hutchinson, me, Joanna Penn. Um, five. Uh, we've got an all-female panel, which I'm quite pleased about. An all-female all panel of under-the-radar indies who are making over fifty grand a year. Some of them, a couple of them, making two, three hundred grand a year. Um, we've got non-fiction with Joseph Alexander, and Mark Recklow, um, and we've got uh, an hour with kind of meet Amazon. Um, so we, we've got people like Darren Hardy and some others uh, who'll be there taking some questions, some live, I think, and some that we might have kind of pre-grabbed. Um, mm. And yeah, and me, and I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about mistakes I've made, which my Vegas speech I'll update it a little bit um, for those who haven't seen that. So yeah, looking forward to it. Um, I like I like big crowds, and this will be one of the bigger ones. I like big crowds. And I cannot lie. Yes, good. Well, that's um, it's going to be quite something. I am starting to get nervous about it now. The sleep is starting to drain out of the evenings, uh, the nights for me. But well, there you go. Hopefully, it'll be worth it. Because if good. anything goes wrong, it will be, it'll be all be your fault. Well, that's why I'm not sleeping because basically I'm hand I'm organising this and um, you're doing very well. But on the other hand, I can bask in the glory if it goes well. Exactly. No, no, I'll I'll do that. I'll take the glory, but I'm not I'm not going to accept any blame. No. So. <laughs> and at the same time, as if we're not busy enough, you and I have launched our publishing company, which is now live. And if you look at uh, the books of Robert Story, uh, who's our first author we have signed, uh, you will see it now says published by Fuse Books, which is our company, and we are just setting up the infrastructure of that. So we're going to repackage the books. Uh, just We've both seen the concept for the new cover for the first book, and it looks fantastic. It does. Yep. It's also going to be a part of this organization to help us with it. Um, and I'm starting to run some Amazon ads, so this is quite an interesting experience for have me. Have you started? 
Uh, I set up a campaign yesterday on and did a lot of autoing just to sort of let it run for an hour and uh, let it run for a day or so and get uh, make Keep, sure everything's mm, everything's working. Yeah. Yes, it's going to run probably for three days, but so far I spent uh, ten dollars twenty five and sold one book. Okay, that's all right. Well, that's that's one book. It's the first book. I hope you're not. I hope you're not advertising deeper into the series. It is the first book of the series. There yes. we go. So we'll work out what our read through is, and um, we'll keep an eye on that. Maybe a good yeah. a good example. Actually, we can actually uh, look at read through with you know fresh, unjaded eyes. It's quite difficult for me to sometimes decouple uh, all the promotions that I've run and things yeah. like that. When you know, and six or seven years worth of data. At least with these switching over to us, we can. Uh, have fairly fresh numbers to look at, and then uh, we can take baselines and compare where we are after we've been running a few campaigns. Yeah, read through obviously is going to be critical to making a decision. I mean, one of the one of the issues you have, um, of course, is you advertise to book one um, because that, for read through that's always the best thing to do. But at the same time, book one is your cheapest book, so you know oh, that, that gap is slightly bigger. That doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. No, don't you worry about that because because so, so yeah. let me ask you a question. If I set up, I set up, I think two auto campaigns because I put one with a line of uh, custom copy in it, one without. Um, and actually, I think we've had two. So I've sell today, so I had one on each of those two campaigns. Um, how long would I leave them running if they're doing basically one or two books a day at this stage? A couple of weeks. A couple of weeks. Oh, really? That long to get data and I would. Yeah, the, the reporting is is very slow sometimes. That's one of the problems with. Amazon ads is that you'll find the sales don't often tally up with what you're seeing in the KDP dashboard. So what you really need, and it's, it's, it would be great if you had someone who had a, a spreadsheet like this, would be to uh, have a spreadsheet that accounts of takes kind of all your ad spend, compares it with read through, and automatically formats the sales to tell you whether you're in profit or loss at various. I don't know if, if one of those. I think Nick Stevenson is good at this sort of yeah, thing. Yeah, he, so he's, he's, he's got great. A, He's great. He's got a really good course as well. So yeah, definitely we should. We yes, should I know. Get in on I that. shall download this, the spreadsheet that I've been handing out to everybody else for the last few years. Um, <laughs> good. Well, I'm only spending six hundred pounds a day at the moment, so I'm just going to start what? off easily. And uh, now I'm doing a tenner on each course. Well, I think on each, have, each campaign. We can afford that. I think. Good. Well, obviously, we. I mentioned this now. Um, it's my uh, experience, my beginning of my experience at the coalface uh, of of the stuff that we've been talking about. Um, so I think it would be an excellent opportunity for us on the show, on the self publishing show, to to blog that story. So we'll um, only if it works. Only if it works, we'll keep quiet. No, if it again, doesn't, if the, it doesn't work, you won't hear about it again. The way I roll is I do everything through a looking glass. Is that right? No, no, looking glass no, is it isn't. isn't it? No. <clears throat> I do everything through a glass ceiling. No, it's something no, else. No. Okay, look, uh, we've been bantering along, full of golden juice, but it's time for what? us to to move on to golden uh, juice. Yes, it's my expression. Uh, time for us to move on to our interview, which is with Valerie J. Lewis Coleman. Quite difficult to say. Valerie is absolutely lovely, and I had a chat with her uh, end of last year. We are talking today about having a book, uh, nonfiction, most likely, that is part of you selling yourself, part of your brand. Not necessarily a book that's going to make money in its own right, but a book that's going to be part of your who you are, your brand, and enable you then potentially to do something like some online course, for instance, as an obvious example, but it might be to be booked as a consultant or as a speaker at conferences. Um, and before we go into the interview, we just say at the front, at the top of this, Mark, this is an area, of course, with SPF that we we understand and we know quite a lot about. And I think you'd probably agree before we've even heard from Valerie that having a book is a really important part of a nonfiction business. I would, yeah. It's um, it, it's 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 a very good way to to find people who are interested in what you have to teach. And selling books is in nonfiction is easier with ads than it is uh, to do fiction because you you're typically solving problems. And so if you can find how people are searching in order to find a solution to their problem, that you can present your solution to them in, as they're looking. So it's it's quite easy to define your audience and then get the answer in front of them. As as right. we as we do quite a lot, we spend quite a lot of money on Facebook ads in SPF and we, we're typically giving away um, books most of the time, free books. Um, and, and that's that's worked really well for us. Yeah, excellent. Okay, let's listen to Valerie. This is The Self-Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Valerie, welcome to The Self-Publishing Show. How are you doing? I am well, James. Thank you for having me. We, you just said about my accent, I love your accent. Well, you know, of course, to me, it doesn't feel like an accent, but I'm sure from your perspective, it is. I love yours, too. It just 
You're in Cambridge. You can. I mean, that's exactly what I sound like. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I, I, I literally in the UK I have no accent. This is middle. This is middle England nondescript accentless. Right. And and there's lots of accents in the UK. You travel a few miles from here and it all changes. But um, but for me, oh. your accent. Anyway, that's that, that's our mutual appreciation of each other's uh, voice, which is good because we're going to have a chat now and we're going to chat about um, helping people get to market with uh, books. And in particular, I think we're going to talk about people who have a skill set, something that they themselves sell, their brand, their teaching, mm-hmm. and that using a book, a professionally published book, as an important tool in getting them more business, right? Absolutely. I mean, without a professionally published book, you may be considered a uh, laughing stock, depending upon what industry you're in. You know, you want so- to be taken seriously. It's that serious. It really do. This is a must-have for any serious professional speaker, for instance, or professional educator. Absolutely. I mean, because it is a reflected reflection of your brand. So, if your book is inferior, if it's not well published, if it hasn't been edited, if you're on the front cover, if it's overpriced, all of those things have an effect on your ability to sell, but also position yourself as an expert. Because if you are a professional speaker, or let's say a medical doctor and you've got a lot of typos in your manuscript, people will question your ability to effectively serve them as a professional speaker or a doctor. Because if you don't consider the fine details of making sure your book is as pristine as possible, I don't know if I want you cutting on my liver. Yeah, I can see that. That's a definitely (laughs) thing. Although famously, of course, we can't read what doctors write. I don't know if that's the same in the States as the UK, but the handwriting is appalling. But but yeah, if you're going to publish a book, it should be attention to detail is uh, is going to be everything when you're putting yourself forward as a professional. So give us a little bit of your background, Valerie. How did you get to where you are now helping uh, people get their books published? Well, I officially started my company in 2006, but almost seven or eight years prior to that, I started helping an author who well, at that time was a writer who was working on fiction. And although she had a great book, when she sent it to me just for my opinion, I found a lot of things that needed some some help. So some of the characters, their actions were predictable or they were so far out. I'm like, is this sci-fi or is this supposed to be, you know, based in? So, and then there were a lot of typographical errors. Um, but I helped her process through that. And then when she was ready to go to print, she contacted me about the publishing aspect of it, the left brain stuff. Writing is very right brain. I'm very left brain, although I can do both. And so I was helping her with the basics of finding a quality printer, making sure that her, that she's not overspending for the price of books. At one point, she purchased bookmarks and they cost her a dollar a piece. I said, absolutely not. You can't give them away for a dollar a piece. So I did some research and I was able to find a way to get her a thousand bookmarks free. But it's all, you know, strategy and understanding. Yeah, understanding some of the tips and techniques. And so I've been serving professional speakers and experts to magnify and monetize their message by publishing quality book officially since 2006, unofficially for about seven or eight years prior to that. And I love what I do. At this point, I've published over 130 authors. I have a client now whose book is at the printer and she'll have it um, just in time for the Dayton Book Expo, an event I do here in Ohio. And and I'm working on my first children's book for me and my grandbaby. So I've got a lot of experience under my belt and a lot of success stories to share. Okay, so let me understand the business model here. You have, uh, you effectively are a publisher then, so you publish the books, or do you teach them how to self-publish? You know, I do all of it, James. From I have books for people who want to learn the process of writing and publishing. Then I mentor people through the process of writing, publishing, and marketing bestsellers. I do live events. So I do workshops, conferences. I travel. I speak. I love to teach. And then lastly, I publish books because I have clients who have the time and not the money. I have clients who have the money and not the time. So I kind of fit them in wherever they are in that continuum of their needs. So I do all of it from uh, helping them with the book to actually publishing the book. So whatever's a good fit for that particular person. Perfect. Okay, well, look, let's let's go to fundamentals here. What is the role of a book for? Um, let, let's you know, it's difficult to do a specific example. Lots of people will be listening here who might be might want a speaking career or they might be wanting to run an online course, for instance, with their skill set. What is the role a book plays in that? Well, the book, you know, it used to be the book was the ultimate completion of what you were trying to do. Now the book is almost like a business card. 
It becomes a tool that opens doors for you to get speaking engagements, paid speaking engagements. It becomes a tool for you to attract clients and customers. And so the books that I use now when I do live events, I have uh, Self-Publishing Made Easy, Passionate Writing, and Self-Publishing Made Easy, Purposeful Publishing. And they are workbooks, so to speak, that I use when I'm teaching at these workshops. And so what happens is at the end of the workshop, of course, people want the book. And so when you have a book, it also opens doors for you to maybe position yourself to get into schools. Because oftentimes, if you want to speak in a new arena, if they're not familiar with you, you can send your book ahead. And if it's well written and well published and well edited, then it becomes an opportunity for them to say, you know what, this person is an expert. They know what they're talking about. They've got proven results. And look, they have a book. And it helps to open doors for you. It's, it's a launching pad for so many other opportunities and income streams, you know, print book, audio book, ebook, of course. Then there's the speaking engagements, live event. There's merchandising. So off of my books, I have t-shirts. I have a coloring book that I'm going to be working on. There are a workbook. I have a fiction that I also wrote a companion nonfiction journal so that people can take the information. The book is The Forbidden Secrets of the Goodie Box. And so ladies want more of that real relationship advice for men. So I took the real relationship advice out and allow them to work through the journal, which shows them how to implement the strategies that were subliminally taught in the book. So there's just so many ways to merchandise that opportunity. And then, of course, like you said, live um, live events and online courses. I'm actually working on an online course now to help authors go from start to finish with writing, publishing and marketing their books and workshops, conferences, speaking engagements. The list goes on. I have clients who have taken their book nonfiction and fiction and made them into stage productions. You just never know. The sky is the limit. But if you don't have the 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 launching pad to start and the book, the book is one of the fastest and easiest ways to build your brand and create this well around who you are and what you do. Yeah. And we're talking primarily nonfiction here. And one of the interesting mm -hmm. differences is that in the fiction world, the old it's a bit of an old idea of, of spending physical time in place like blog tours we only really hear negative things about they take up people's time and mm -hmm. with the exception maybe of children's authors going into schools I think that's still quite important but for most mm -hmm. fiction authors it's in front of your computer where you, the bucks are but for non-fiction authors there is a big market out there Absolutely. for speaking for personal appearances and a lot of follow-up business for being physically somewhere right absolutely I mean like if you are an expert whatever field you're an expert in nine times out of ten there's two or three hundred people, if not thousands, who want to do what you've already done. And if you are successful in, in, you know, say, for example, if you're successful in mentoring people, if you're a life coach, you know, if, that, if that's what you do for people and you're specifically a life coach, having a book that you can use to either coach these people through the process or having a book that you can use to win them over. Because at the end of the day, I have some packages that go from you know, the books are $15 and I have packages that go up to $5,000. Well, not everybody can afford the $5,000 package. But if I have an option of a book or I have an option of a mentoring package that maybe is, is significantly less, they then can still get a piece of me without having to invest quite as much money. So it, it just opens more doors and more opportunities. And Yeah, it can be a bit daunting, I think, for some people with a nonfiction um, expertise in knowing where they should be putting their effort into because there's as you said, there's lots of different channels and they can be priced at one-to-one, -one, quite expensive and mass mm -hmm. audience quite low, but you can't necessarily do everything all the time. Do you also provide advice and coaching in that area and, and what the offering is? Absolutely. I mean, what, when I sit down with my clients, I really have them do a couple of um, surveys, if you will. I interview them, but I do it digitally through like Google Forms and I get a lot of information about them, what their overall objectives are, because some of my clients just want to write the book because it's been a lifelong dream. Some of my clients want to write the book. One of my particular clients, um, Justice Mace, he wanted to write a book to honor his sister who had, who had died. He was giving his books away. I have other people who want to do books just to leave a legacy for their family, leave their inheritance and, and leave their history for their family. Then most of my clients, though, are in it to make money. And so when I find out what their overall objective is, as I'm putting the book together, as I'm mentoring them through the process, I'm always considering what they want to do. Some of them don't want to speak. You know, a lot of authors, because they are right brain and introverted, they don't want to get out in front of people. 
So we come up with other things that they can do to still leverage their expertise, but not put them in front of people as much. However, regardless of what type of expert you're in or what type of book you're publishing, you need to get out in front of people. Yeah, you do have to be a people person ultimately if you're yes. going to be selling selling yourself as an expert, uh, right. which again is n that's a, one of the differences I think between fiction and non-fiction. Quite a lot of fiction authors are would describe themselves introverted. It's by no means all, um, right. but quite a lot. Whereas a lot of non-fiction authors are people. In fact, I can tell, like yourself, Valerie, comfortable in front <laughs> of the camera, comfortable talking about what they do and selling themselves. I'm absolutely comfortable in front of this camera, James, but I tell you that I am so introverted. It's crazy. I am. I learned recently there's a term called an ambivert. So I am the kind of person I can do what I have to do to get the message out, you know, to to get people to understand what I'm doing with enthusiasm and passion. But when I'm done, I have to go home and take a nap because I pour out of myself. And I, as an introvert, I prefer quiet time alone to sit at home and recover Whereas, you know, extroverts, they like to be around people. Uh, I can be around people, but after a while, I'm drained. So I have to go home and sit down. Well, that sounds very much like <laughs> our, our friend Joe Penn, who uh, is brilliant on stage and uh, gregarious, I would say, with her personality, but would also say the same as you. She's actually yes. sometimes crippled by introversy uh, on those occasions. So, yeah, it's interesting, more common than, than you think. OK, so let's uh, let's get down to some details here. So let's imagine we've got this this person who has an expertise and maybe they're thinking about um, speaking, which is, a you know, mm -hmm. is that a. Uh, for many people, can that be a living speaking engagement by themselves? Absolutely. I mean, and you have to look at speak engagements from a couple of different perspectives. You can get speaking engagements where you're not paid. But if you are in front of the right audience, if you are in front of your ideal reader or your ideal client and you have enough of them in the room, then you can not get paid for an event and still come home with a lot of money. James, I do want to say that book the book business is not just about money. Because for me, it's about changing lives and transforming lives. But to do that, I have to have money. So I don't want your listeners to think, well, she's just about money. She's just about money. No, I have to eat. I have to have my laptop so I can see you. I have, you know, so all of that, there's money tied to that. But I will say, yes, absolutely. I've had speaking engagements where maybe they paid a, a nominal fee, nowhere near my standard speaking fee. But then I was able to sell thousands of product, thousands of dollars in product and coaching packages. Then I've been to events where they paid a fee, paid my fee, but then I didn't sell any product. So it really depends on what you want to do as the person. But yes, you can make a living as a speaker. The, the majority of my income comes in from me going out and speaking, selling books and selling packages. I don't sell a lot of books just like on Amazon or just at a live event unless I'm speaking. When I speak, I engage the people. They like what I have to say. And then I have learned some of the marketing strategies and the way you seed your message without saying, come buy my books. There are things you can do throughout the presentation that are like, oh, my gosh, I have to go buy her book. So absolutely, you can earn a living as a speaker. Little asides during the talk, there's a whole chapter about this in the book. And then you move on. So just planting <laughs> that sort of thing, planting the idea yeah, that I need, yeah, I need that yeah. book. Okay, so the book itself, um, which, as you say, is a bit of a calling card now, a bit of a shop window for a nonfiction uh, author. Um, is there a particular way you talk to people about approaching the book? I mean, some people may have a book down in another form. We talked about this on previous podcasts. They may have done so mm -hmm. many YouTube videos you know, talking mm -hmm. about different aspects of their expertise. They've got all the mm -hmm. material. They don't even realize it. Um, mm -hmm. But how do you approach structuring a book so it is as you say, professional? Well, I have some clients who do like inspirational quotes or posts on Facebook all the time. And then I've told a couple of them, you know, if you go back and look at what you had and capture those, even though they may be small um, nuggets because you can only post so much on social media, you have enough to give a book of, of daily inspirations for probably a year. I never thought about that. You know, or like you said, going on YouTube and capturing that content. I have people who have videos and podcasts. And, and if it's not something that you want to download and transcribe yourself, there are services that you can use to transcribe that information and then convert it into book form. Or uh, uh, lots of times experts put out reports and white paper and documents that they have that depending upon who they're trying to reach with their message, they can take those documents or their blogs, if they're a blogger, and compile those into a book. So there's so many different ways to get started. And like you said, a lot of people already have a good start and don't even 
know that they have a good start. Yeah. I suppose one of the slight downsides of a book from, in the nonfiction space is that it's it's printed, it's in black and white. An online course, you know, we, we update our courses every week. There's something that's changed mm-hmm. somewhere in Instagram mm-hmm. or somewhere we update one of our courses. Not so easy with a, with a printed book. Absolutely. You know, not quick as the change on demand, but like one of the, the books that I use for the self-publishing, teaching people to self-publish are in journal form. So whenever there's a change in the industry or whenever I want to add or, you know, because sometimes I may refer to a company that's no longer in existence, I can take them out. And when I go to reprint, it's a lot easier than if I have a book, you know, in final book form with the um, perfect binding and everything and having to go back and go through that process all over again. So the books that I use that are more um, time sensitive are journal form, spiral bound journals that I can just easily print 10 or 20 if I need to print 10 or 20. So that's one way that you know, a nonfiction author can negate if they're in an industry that has a constant shift of information is instead of doing a final, a full book in per- perfect bind, then they can do it as a journal and make it available at their live events or through their website. Okay. So what sort of clients are you dealing with? Ooh, okay. Well, that's a good question. <laughs> most of my clients, when I think about my clients, most of them, some of them are professional, already professional speakers. They just needed the book. But a lot of my clients are people who have a story that they want to tell. And so they're not professional speakers per se, but they are experts in their specific field. So the young lady whose book is coming out, Skylar Marsh, her book will be available at the end of this month. Her book is OMG, which means Operating as a Millennial with God. OMG, Operating as a Millennial with God. And so she's this young person, 19 years old. She has a lot of spiritual background and she wanted to help other millennials understand their value. And it's not so much what we see on TV or how the media depicts some of our young people, but you have much more value and worth than what you wear and how you behave if you're behaving, you know, erratically. I don't know what they do in the UK, but in the United States, these young people get a little lit, as they say. Yeah. And so it's she's really empowering them to understand your worth comes from within. If you don't have money to wear the latest fashions and if you don't have a lot of this or a lot of stuff, so to speak, your value is coming by who you are on the inside. And she's really empowering them with that message. So so she's not an expert per se. and She's very introverted. So I'm working with her to to help her, you know, boost herself to be able to get the message out. And then other clients I've worked with uh, have written books on relationships. I have clients. And so now what they're doing is live events and, you know, working to position themselves. I have clients who have written a a children's book and she was doing fairly well with the children's book. I didn't publish her book, but she hired me because she wanted to be an Amazon bestseller. And so I went through, critiqued her book, cover to cover, made some recommendations. Those are very good book. She is a principal, so she has a PhD in it or ED, uh, education doctorate. And so her synopsis and her bio read to as if she were talking to theologians and and dissertations. And and I said, but well, how old are the people you want to buy the book? But about five to eight. Okay, then you need to write at Hmm. their level, even though their parents are going to be the one to buy it. The kids are going to be the one to say, I want that book. So I helped her, you know, revisit her synopsis and her bio to make it more appealing to the audience she was trying to attract. So she's a professional. Most of my clients have so far have been women and um, and and then nonfiction. Yeah. And in terms of the book itself, the process people go through, um, you uh, presumably advocate an, a strong editorial aspect to the production of the book. Absolutely. I With my publishing packages, depending upon the, I have three options through Queen V Publishing, V for Valerie. And the three options, the, the top two options actually include me editing. I don't do edit as a standalone. I'm not a professional editor, but I'm very anal when it comes to a lot of that stuff. So I do more of the developmental type editing. I'm making sure the story is clear and concise. I will have them add content here, take content out. And of course, if their objective is to become a speaker or to host live events, I always see that type of information throughout the manuscript. And then I do a preliminary uh, content, a content and then a copy type edit. But then I always send it back to them. So we go back and forth several times. I recommend they have a team of people who I've dubbed the power team to read the book out loud. And um, it, as a group, as a collective, if, if possible, read it out loud and take turns reading it so that everybody can 
act and, you know, because oftentimes when we're reading, we, we do these nonverbal gestures and these body movements that may or may not be reflected in the book, especially if you're writing um, creative nonfiction. You know, if you're telling part of your story and maybe you didn't incorporate this particular thing in there, but when you read it out loud, your head is rocking. If, you know, and you're, the people are like, hey, that's not in here. That should be in here. So it's a great way to help flesh it out. But when it comes to editing, they I, I indicate to my clients that there are five levels of edit. There's the self-edit, which is where a lot of self-published authors stop. They figure it's good enough. I've edited it. I've read it 20 times. It's the way it's supposed to be. This is my baby and I'm not going to change it. And those people tend not to sell a lot of books because you don't know what you don't know. And if you're not familiar with industry standards, if you're not familiar with word choice, and if you're not even familiar with how to position yourself as an expert in the writing, you'll miss the mark. And then the second edit, which is what I refer to as the power team, is like five to seven people and not the people who always tell you you do a wonderful job because you've got some people, James, no matter how awful you are, they're going to say James is the best thing since sliced bread, right? There's just those people, mom, dad, family, friends, you know, those type of people are always think you're just so wonderful. You have a podcast. Oh my gosh, James is wonderful. You don't want those people on your team because they're going to say everything you've done is great. And you want people who are going to give you honest feedback, but they are going not, not to not to cut you down and, and criticize to the point where you feel defeated, but they're going to tell you, you know, that's a good storyline, but maybe consider adding this here, or I don't understand this, take that out, or move this here, or you forgot this, you know, those type of real relevant insight. And I recommend the team consist of maybe two to three avid readers, someone who's proficient in business, and maybe a couple of people who are proficient in marketing. Because again, your book is a launching tool for where you want to go next. And if all you're thinking about is writing the book, and if all you're thinking about is writing the book, and if you're telling your story, I'm telling my story. But if you're not telling your story so that it affects the readers, you're just telling your story. It doesn't. How does your story benefit the next person? How is what you've gone through going to help somebody else get through it? How is your message going to be conveyed so that people, when they read it, they can relate and it becomes a part of who they are? And if it's about entertaining, then great. If it's about changing their lives, it's great. If it's about communicating information, you want to make sure that whatever you're telling in your story, how does it relate to the next person? What they call it, uh, what's in it for me, W-I-I-F-M or something like that. What's in it for me? Yeah. You know what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, right. So if it's your book and it's your story. So I tell my clients, I have a lot of clients. When I work with them, they have written about themselves. One client, a couple of clients have written about overcoming domestic abuse. So when I first talked to her, I said, what's your book about? It's about me and getting through domestic abuse. I said, okay. Um, so when you talk to other people, don't tell them that. She said, well, why not? I said, because a lot of people have gone through domestic abuse. You have to position yourself so that when you tell people about your book, it relates to them or somebody they know. So do you know anybody who's ever been a victim of domestic abuse? Have you or anyone you know had to have to come, you know, leave in the middle of the night? escape from where they were living because they were in, their life was in danger, you know, position it like that. People are like, what? Yeah. And then they, they can see, if they don't see themselves in it, they probably know somebody else who, who can be, who has been affected by it or who is in the process. So if you're telling me, you know, a way that my girlfriend can get out of this abusive relationship and survive, I need to know that. But if you tell me, you're telling me your life story, I'm not so impressed. And I think that's important for people to understand. I think that's a really good point. And I think what, well a good way of looking at this is is if somebody's searching on the internet they're not searching for your life experience they're searching mm. for an answer Absolutely. Right? so they're going to say how do i leave my husband they might type that in and your result needs to come up for them you yes. need to be answering that so if you're just yeah you're right i think that um and a lot of people do think that they do think i've had and I mean this very respectfully to people. They've had, I've had an amazing family experience with what, what's happened, what I've gone through. I need mm -hmm. to put this in a book to help other people. But they don't make that extra step that you're talking about, which mm -hmm. is to really focus the book on other people. And, and it's almost like a, what a developmental editor does to a fiction author at the Absolutely. early stages. They don't talk about what chapter heading should be or where the commas should be. They talk about what's happening in the book and how yes. whether the story works or not. And everything's a story, right? So your nonfiction book has to have a narrative that works as well. Absolutely. You know, you got to look about at the big picture. How is this going to serve? Like you said, how is this going to fix a problem? How is this going to help the reader? And another thing that I found that a lot of nonfiction authors do is they put them, if the book is about themselves, they put their name in the title. And then they also put themselves, the image of themselves on the front cover. It's not impressive. 
If you're Tony okay. Robbins, maybe it works. You say what? If you're Tony Robbins, maybe it works. Put <laughs> right. yourself on the cover. Absolutely. But, if you're if you're a well known household, you know. I mean, there are certain people. If 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 the prince wrote wrote a book, he should be on the front cover because his likeness, his face, his name, it's going to sell the book. If I write a book and I've written eight or nine books, I'm not putting myself on the cover. I don't care if I've got beautiful hair, I got my teeth cleaned and shiny and white. I had I paid a thousand dollars for new makeup and got this beautiful. It's not going to sell the book because what it says to readers is this book is about me, not them. It's my vanity move. I just wanted to have something to say, here, look at me, and it's not going to attract them. I had one young lady I was mentoring who who had a beautiful book. I think the message was powerful. I didn't actually I didn't actually mentor her because you know I can't teach everybody, and she wasn't receptive to what I was saying. She has this beautiful book, beautiful cover, and she's a beautiful girl. And so what she did on her book was put herself on the front of her book, cute dress, cute hair, vibrant colors, is beautiful. But it doesn't speak to the person. And I and I said, she said, well, I'm in a better place now. So this book is letting women understand that they can live a better life. I said, yeah, but the woman who's not living a better life right now can't see herself in you. She doesn't see the process you went through because all you showed her is that, like I said, you show the glory and none of the gory. She doesn't see herself through that process. She can't see herself standing as proud and confident and bold in, in falling in love with herself and being in a better space. Because you've, you've taken her out of the picture. And so we have to be mindful of that, that if if we're trying to win people over, it's, it's important to know who your ideal reader is. It's important to know who you're trying to connect. It's important to know your demographics. And when I talk to clients, I get to the to the details. Are you dealing with men or women? Because one of the things that I hate the most is who's your book for? Everybody wants my book. Mm. Wrong answer. Everybody doesn't want your book. Everybody doesn't read. Everybody doesn't read your type of book. Everybody doesn't read English. You know, and well, all women, my book's for all women. No, it's not. It's, it's not possible. How are you going to reach all women? And I'll say, wait a minute. I, hold on. I'll wait. Tell me, how are you going to reach all women? Uh, right. You can't do that. But if you identify, I'm writing to African American Christian women between the ages of 20 and 40 who are dealing with domestic violence. I can find those women now. When I write, I can speak to those women. When I'm telling my story, my story speaks specifically to them. Not to say that other people won't buy the book. But when I've identified with great detail and specificity who I'm trying to connect with, it also helps me as the writer to stay focused on what I'm telling. Because when you're talking about your life story, it's easy to have so much to say that you say nothing. Yeah. So do you find most of your coaching is this? It's telling people what, how they should be shaping their message and their book rather than the nuts and bolts of publishing, which frankly, you know, quite a few people teach but this stuff you're talking about here is like the gold bit the, the bit that not everybody sees of how to turn what they know into something that can help other people absolutely that's that's a good portion of it because i find my strength is in publishing i'm an engineer by degree and so my strength is in publishing i help my clients do it better faster quicker easier smarter saving money but still putting out a quality product so it's nothing for me to save my clients thousands of dollars just when it comes to the printing you know, the printing aspect of the book business, not to mention all the other things. So that's my strength. But what I'm finding is I have to back up into the writing part of it and the conceptualizing part of it because a lot of people are overwhelmed. So I've, I've started this new Facebook group, a Free Your Mind Writers Club with Valerie J. Lewis Coleman. And what I found is that a lot of people are stuck in the writing. Because they're writing nonfiction. I want to tell my story. Well, what part of your story do you want to tell? Well, I think I want to talk about this, 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 and that. I said, okay, right now you've got a seven-headed monster like the tetrahedron in Greek mythology. You're going to have to cut the head off of at least five of those monsters and one of the monsters. And the, and the second, and the, you have two heads left. You're still going to cut one of them down. You can't tell your whole life story. Be very specific. Now, maybe you tell this this book, you tell your process of overcoming poverty to be a successful you know, doctor, and maybe you write another book on how you overcame this to do that. Or maybe you write another book. They may be several different books, but you can't tell your whole life story in one book. It's it's impossible. It's going to cost you way too much money. You've got now, if you're writing, like you said, if you're writing a fiction, you could possibly get away with a 900 page book, although I don't recommend it. You could get away with a book of a lot more page count. But as a nonfiction, people typically aren't looking to read three or 400 pages 
page book on how to do something. They want the nuts and bolts of it so that you can get, so they can experience a transformation in a relatively quick time. So if you're telling them how to, I don't know, now if you tell them how to make a million dollars in 30 days, they might want a 5,000 page book and they might flip through it. But even with that, if, if I'm telling you how you can do it in 30 days, more than likely, I can't even read the book effectively in 30 days. So you have to think about all of those aspects of your book. And it's the fine details that make the difference. I was working with a client who's writing a book for millennials when it comes to relationships, mostly like high school age kids and and the challenges that the girls are having and understanding the boys and how they keep getting in trouble and they keep making the same mistakes. And they think if I give him all of me, then I'll have his heart. And then they're upset when they see him with somebody else. So she was writing a, a, a good book. However, in finished book form, it was almost 300 pages. I said, you can't do that for your audience. The millennials, high school kids are not going to read a 300 page book that tells them, don't do this, don't do that, stop doing this, you better do that. They're not going to do it. And if you get it down to 100, 120 pages and it's very clear, concise, they like bullets. They like quick responses. They like do this, do that. They don't need a lot of narrative when it comes to some of the the message that you're trying to convey. So you have to be un, um, have a good understanding of your audience. So if you're dealing with a lot of young people, they're not going to want that. If you're writing children's books, you have to be clear on the age of the children. If you're writing to one to three year olds, you tend to have one and two syllable words and the parents are going to be reading to them for the most part. You know, if you're dealing with a slightly older age group, then maybe you have three or four syllable words. My granddaughter is four years old and she told me the other day she wants to be an archaeologist. I fell out of my chair. What do you know about an archaeologist? Arche, that's five syllables. She said, well, Mimi, they, um, they dig up dinosaur bones. Oh, okay. Well, but you have to, you have to know what your intended audience wants and what they're capable of. And I don't know about the UK, but in the United States, they said you should write at the average reading level of someone in the eighth grade. If you hit that benchmark, then you can, you have a wider mass appeal, you know, but I have, I've worked with people who use words that I, I'm fairly smart. You know, I'm somewhat proficient and they have I, the first page. I had to pull out a dictionary and look up like 30 of the words. I'm like, I don't know what these words are. I've never heard them. You know, I have a little bit of knowledge of how you can dissect words and understand what they mean around the content. But if I've got a sentence of five words and I don't understand three of them, I can't figure this sentence out. So you have to be mindful of all of those things, especially with nonfiction. How do people know whether their area that they might be good at in their life, they're thinking about monetizing or growing mm -hmm. kind of nonfiction business? How do they know if it's going to work or not? Or whether it's whether it's of value or not? OK, I was going to say because it'll work as long as they work it. But I think the value also comes in their ability to position themselves and to work it. I know some people don't don't perceive themselves or don't see themselves as experts in their particular field or whatever. So and as I tell them, whatever you're proficient at, whatever you get paid to do at your day job, if it's transferable skills, that may be a good indication of something that you can write a book about. Whatever, whatever your passion is, whenever sometimes people will come up to you and say, you know what, you are just so good at such and such, or you're the go to person. When I need such and such, I know I can go to you. Those type of things are clues or cues that people can indicate to you that give you some idea as to what your skill set may be. Because oftentimes when we're proficient in things, we don't know that we're necessarily proficient in it because it's just what we do. So I've had people tell me, you are, um, hilarious. I'm like, I'm not a comedian. Girl, you should. No, that's not my proficiency. But if people think I'm funny, okay, now I'm not going to launch a career in comedy. It's just something that I use. I think it's part of my introversion to kind of get through that. But it does help to know that those are your skills. So I tell my clients, like, especially with social media, go out to your fans, friends, and followers and ask them for three to five powerful adjectives to describe you. You'll be surprised how they may perceive you. And you may find some things, and I ha especially have them do that when they're trying to construct their bios, because oftentimes, especially women, we have a hard time selling ourselves and bragging on ourselves. And writing a bio is a lot about bragging on yourself. And so I have them go out and find powerful words that people would use to describe you. And they get a lot of uh, understanding about themselves because we only know what we know. You think about Jahari's window, the four different windows, and I only know what I know about myself, but other people perceive me differently than I may perceive myself. And you may find a lot of your strength in relying on people who know you well. So yeah, absolutely. There's all kinds of things that we may be proficient at or skilled at 
that are second nature is a term that people tend to say, or I can do it on automatic pilot. I can do it in my sleep. Those are probably the types of things that you can use to serve other people. Because if you're proficient in administration, for example, a lot of people aren't. They're not very well organized. They can't keep track of things. They can't stay on task. If you're a good organizer, you may be someone who can write a book about simple tips and strategies about how to organize, whether it's your, because whether it's your closet or your, you can't see this right now. I'm in the process of moving from one home to another. I have clutter everywhere. And that clutter begins on what it reflects. Sometimes it could be reflective of what's going on inside the brain. So if I've got clutter all over the place, it's hard for me to think effectively because the clutter on the outside reflects the clutter on the inside. I can't wait to finish moving so I can put this stuff up so my brain can be like, ah, I can breathe again. But, but you know, all those things can have an effect and can be used as a tool to position you as an expert. We're experts in something. We just have to figure out what it is. And yes, sometimes I spend my time with clients helping them understand where their expertise lies. Some of them know, but they don't know how to monetize it. And that's another thing that I'll help them, you know, sit down and position. And for those who don't want to do the live events or the speaking engagements, then that creates a, a whole nother dynamic that can be a little more challenging. Um, because as an author, you really need to get out there in front of the people virtually and live networking, social media groups, you know, connecting to people so that they see you as that go-to person. So now I'm the go-to person for publishing. I just had a gentleman over in Africa say, I have this friend who finished a book. She, it's a good book. She doesn't know how to market it. And she said, I need help. I said, Valerie's the one. Okay. That's great for me. So I've positioned myself so that when people have a question of somebody else about writing, publishing, or marketing, they say, go see her. But that came over time. And it's a process of being intentional and deliberate and singular in focus because initially I was not singular in focus. And so I had to decide, am I going to talk to women who are struggling to experience a fulfilling relationship by revealing the forbidden secrets of the goodie box? Or am I going to serve professional speakers and experts to magnify and monetize their message by publishing quality books? And when I became singular in focus and focused on the authors and the writers and those people who need help, then that changed the trajectory of my business. So now, I, you know, I earn a living helping people with their books, not so much selling my own books, and, except when I'm doing live events, but the mentoring of clients. And, and the mentoring I do is from writing, publishing, and marketing. And more so I'm finding now. So for, to answer your question, I didn't see myself as a marketing person. I was just doing what I needed to do to let people know I had a book and I had a live event. And then people just started saying, hey, can you help me market this? Hey, can you help me with this? Hey, can you show me how to do this? I said, I'm not a marketing person. Even on LinkedIn, it sends all these job searches. These people look for you and you go good for these. And a lot of them are PR and public relations and job and marketing. I said, I don't want. I said, wait a minute. I think these people are telling me something. You're an expert. Yeah, right. But I didn't see myself as that because I was just doing what needed to be done. So then what I started doing was creating packages and programs to help people who were already authors. I was focusing on the writers, how to get them published. But now I'm focusing and most of my revenue is generated by helping those who are already authors but want to learn how to sell more books. The self-published author only sells about 75 copies of their book. And a lot of that is due, in fact, to the inferior quality of their book. A lot of it is due to not knowing who their audience is. A lot of it is due to the fact that they don't want to get out and do the work to position themselves as an expert. And so what I'm doing is helping my clients sell hundreds and thousands of books by positioning them as experts in whatever field they're, you know, they're shooting for. Superb. Well, Valerie, we've rattled through our sort of 40 minutes or so. I've got one last question, which is how buoyant is this market because it feels to me that with the internet the digitization of the economy mm -hmm. now is the opportunities have never been greater for somebody with an expertise mm -hmm. to yeah and let's not apologize about saying the word monetize because we'll have to make a living and mm -hmm. you could argue that writers haven't been paid enough over the last couple of hundred years <laughs> and that might be changing now and so how how buoyant is that opportunity now to you to, for you to monetize your expertise I think it's very, very buoyant. I know for me it's buoyant. And I think for other skill sets, it, it's very much buoyant because 
Now, because of the internet, because of the advent of technology, now I don't just have to connect with people whom I see directly. I don't just have to go, you know, to drive somewhere and connect with people. Now I can literally reach people over in the UK, over in Africa, because of the advent of technology. And, and depending upon how you set your book up and how you set up your company, you can actually work with people as mentoring them through, you know, podcast type options or even some of the um, software that allows you to do conference calls. So you can coach people virtually from across the world. So there's no limits to what you can do. The, the limits only are in your ability to identify your skill set and identify the people who need what you can do for them. Again, you have to find their, understand what problems you fix for people and then prove that you can fix it and repeat that you can fix it and then position yourself as an expert. Because again, as an engineer, for me, it's about repeatability. So if I've done it for this person and that person and 130 other people, then I know I can do it for other people. And so that helps to leverage my expertise as I leverage my clients' expertise. Valerie, where can people find you? My website is penofthewriter.com, and that's P-E-N as an ink pen, penofthewriter.com. And if they connect with me, um, I have a complimentary discovery session that I will offer to your listeners and your viewers, I guess, since we're doing this by video. Yeah, yeah and they can go to HTTPS, so it's a secure site colon backslash backslash pen of the writer dot a s dot m e that's h t t p s colon backslash backslash pen of the writer dot a s dot m e and schedule a complimentary discovery session and i'm not available until may because i'm moving and i'm executing a citywide book event i've been doing for 10 years that happens at the end of this month. And then I'm working on a couple client books, but they can book with me into May and we can sit down and talk about some of their goals and objectives and ac expectations and aspirations and challenges and how I can help them overcome those challenges. Superb. Okay. Well, obviously we'll put those links into the show notes as they are quite complicated. And uh, <laughs> Valerie, I want to say thank you. It's been, uh, it's been a tour de force for the thank last uh, uh, three quarters of an hour or so. And uh, it's been great talking to you. So thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. This is the Self Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. There we go. Valerie J. Lewis Coleman. And uh, lovely to chat to Valerie uh, end of last year. Good. OK, well, I think that's probably about it uh, from us this week. Anything extraordinary happened in uh, the world of publishing that I've missed? Um, I launched a book last Last Friday, it's gone done quite well as as we record this. Yeah, the vault has been out for Is it a while. In the vault, it's done well. Um, not as well as a Milton book, but that's not particularly surprising. But it's done. Is the vault not a Milton book? It's uh, it doesn't feature Milton, but it is kind of a, a very kind of it's a prequel, a deep prequel with with deep lots prequel. of um, Easter eggs for those who've read. Um, it deeper into the series so yeah it's and it was a fun one to write but it's got great reviews a lot of people uh, some of the reviewers are saying it's their favorite book that they've read of mine i had a lot of fun writing it um it's a bit of a romp so um is there, is there any rompy in it there is no romping i don't romp do you do no. sex scenes do i do sex scenes no i, I don't. don't mean in real life i mean in your books <laughs> no i don't and i'm looking forward to reading your sex scene um in in the uh in the last flight i i take my sex scene out there's a little bit of nudity in it but um God, probably PG thirteen. Um, I did write a sex scene in my very first draft back in twenty ten, and I felt so embarrassed about it. I just took it. I let, no one's ever seen that. The only in joke was they they had to go away for the weekend because it was um, the sixties. You know, the landlady wouldn't allow male visitors for her, and he was in the officers' mess. Quite, quite right. So they went away somewhere in Wiltshire, actually, uh, to the Cock Inn, and uh, they had a weekend uh, there. I see what you've done there. That's see it. what I did there. That's a, that's a, that's the kind of layered. Um, intrigue there is in my book right good thank you very much indeed mark it's always a pleasure to catch up with you and uh, i haven't put my picture up yet from stuart grant that we talked about last week but what should be up and live by the time this so this is something we can mention uh should be up and live by the time this podcast goes out is uh that image of the two ronnies which is a uk uh, comedy combo from the years gone by and the two glasses which we've kind of appropriated there we go. That image on a T-shirt. And you'll find that in our merch store if you go to selfpublishingformula.com forward slash merch. Uh, but I'm going to put my picture up there. I've decided it's going to go uh, just to the other side of that Vulcan. Good. 
Right, that's it. Which leaves me only one thing to say, which is that it's a good night from him. And a good night from me. Goodbye. Get show notes, the podcast archive, and free resources to boost your writing career at selfpublishingshow.com. Join our thriving Facebook group at selfpublishingshow.com forward slash Facebook. Support the show at patreon.com forward slash selfpublishingshow. And join us next week for more help and inspiration so that you can make your mark as a successful indie author. Publishing is changing, so get your words into the world and join the revolution with The Self-Publishing Show.